welcome to We Are Not a Stereotype, Breaking Down Asian Pacific American Bias. Thank you for being here with us for this inaugural series of talks created for educators by educators. My name is Andrea Kim Neighbors, and I'm the Manager of Education Initiatives at the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center in Washington, DC. We could not have made this talk and series possible without our brilliant speaker and educator, Rose Ann Rico Eborda Gutierrez, who you'll be hearing from shortly. We're so grateful for the space they're creating with us to talk about the racialization of undocumented Asians. As Rose Ann and I are in different parts of the United States, we want to begin this talk acknowledging the people and lands we're currently on. We would like to acknowledge the people of the land, past, present, and future. The Piscataway, the original stewards of the area commonly known as Washington, D.C., where the Smithsonian Institution is located. The Tongva, the original stewards of the area commonly known as Los Angeles, California, where Roseanne is located. We also would like to take a moment to recognize those nations who are not acknowledged, yet occupy or have occupied the lands we teach on. I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors since this series would not be possible without their support. This project received federal support from the Asian Pacific American Initiatives Pool, as well as support from Expedia. We would like to thank them for sponsoring this series and for making this learning opportunity available online for educators across the country. I'm now pleased to introduce Rose Ann Rico Eborda Gutierrez, a PhD student at the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles, a former middle school teacher, community organizer, and author of articles, book chapters, and reports about undocumented students. Her research explores the analytical nexus between race, racism, and racial racialization, immigration, and social stratification in education. Roseanne, thank you very much. Thank you so much for that introdu introduction. Andrea, I'm really excited to be here with you with everything that's happening right now. And I think that this is a really important conversation that we need to have in our own community, uh, especially more generally, um, given the decision that has been made um, about DACA this past month. So thank you again for the lovely introduction. Um, my name is Rose Enrico Iborda Gutierrez, and I will be presenting on um, and the racialization of undocumented agents. So my presentation is entitled Living at the Intersection of Undocumented and, um, and Asian, the Racialization of Undocumented Agents. So again, here I am. My name is Rosie Enrico Iborda Gutierrez. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And as Andrea has mentioned, I, I've been a middle school teacher. Um, I taught in Miami, Florida. Then I did my master's in Seattle, Washington where I was a student affairs practitioner uh, working in residence life with students in an arts college, and then now I'm a current PhD student. I want to mention, though, that even though you all have heard my credentials, um, I do not see my identity rooted in my work. I think that's really important for me. I see who I am as an amalgamation of everything I've experienced in life. So that means where I've been, who I've met, and what I've learned from it all. And I honestly cannot tell and share who I am without honoring my parents' immigration story, our immigration story. I came here when I was seven years old from the Philippines. And, and it's about honoring them and honoring our families in this presentation as we talk about immigration. So I think for me and how I see myself um, are three things, a storyteller, a translator, and a woman of faith. And as a storyteller, I've learned that individually, my Filipino American history, and our collective histories as, Asia, as an Asian American community has not been told in books. It's either been excluded or just completely erased um, when we talk about US history. And so for me, I've learned how to talk about who I am, my parents' stories, and again, our collective history um, through something that in Tagalog is called kwentuhan, um, which means that we're basically sharing stories at like the table or maybe in the car rides and uh, and this is really important um, as a part of uh, me doing this presentation, um, sharing even the stories of others as we, as we see numbers, you will see numbers, but remember that these are numbers and behind these numbers are people who are actually living their lives, dehumanized experiences, especially for undocumented folks. Um, and for, for me and how I define translator is not just being able to translate one language to another. So I still speak Tagalog and um, I speak it to my parents. So I translate things for them from English to Tagalog, Tagalog to English. And I've been doing that all of my life and I've actually had to learn doing that, especially documents from school at a very young age in elementary school. And so um, there is a scholar, her name is Marjorie 
Oriana, and she calls the term cultural broking. And what immigrant students do is really translate for their parents, not just linguistically, but the cultural nuances of this new culture that they have to then adapt to. And that's really important. And also for me as an academic and a researcher, it's now translating the academic language, the jargon that often is not accessible for others so that others can understand this information and do something else with it in practice. So that's something that I also will be doing in practice today during this presentation. And lastly, um, I, I am a woman of faith and it's interesting because I am in the field of research and evidence when something has to be proven um, through what is seen, right? And for me, having faith in a lot of things is important because there's something that I just can't explain. Um, and being a researcher and a PhD student, I lean on this um, and the assurance and confidence that all things I've asked for is, is and will happen. So I'd like to begin this presentation by going over three objectives that um, I break down and how I pre uh, present the information um, throughout this, this webinar. So the first thing is really understanding what legal status and more specifically undocumented status really means. It's not just about somebody who's a citizen versus somebody who's not a citizen. And then I'll go over statistics um, that, that really looks at the larger demographic portrait of a say, undocumented population in the US to give you all a general overview of that. And then we will go into actually examining this undocumented narrative through the lens of um, history and contemporary perspectives about undocumented Asians. And that's when I will talk about racialization and I'll define it then as well. And then lastly, because I know educators are also watching this, it's being able to identify practices to support undocumented, all undocumented students, right? And then a lot of other cultural nuances that I think is really important when working with undocumented Asians specifically. So I'd really like to begin this conversation um, by, by us having uh, um, this understanding that terms and the words that we use are actually constructs of power, right? So as you see on this slide, this is um, Jose Antonio Vargas, and he is a Filipino undocumented immigrant. And actually the, the quote that you see on this slide is from his book, um, Dear America, Notes from an Undocumented Citizen, which was published in 2018. And it's really important because I just suppose this with the image that you see on this slide, because um, there's a scholar, her name is uh, Dr. Cecilia Menjivar, and she's written extensively about constructing immigrant illegality. And other scholars have um, written about this too. And what they really say is that undocumented status in itself uh, um, has been a legal and social construction through restrictive immigration policy and laws. So in other words, and simply put, what that means is illegality, or what we know as um, somebody who has been categorized as an undocumented immigrant was created through US policies that was restrictive, right? Um, with the intent of excluding specific foreigners. So I would also like to go over terms um, like an authorized, undocumented, and um, illegal, which I do not use because it's not even about being politically correct, but bodies cannot be illegal. Acts in itself, yes, because of how, again, the US policy and laws have written them, but bodies cannot be illegal. Um, and using that term dehumanizes every experience, the dignity, um, and it really takes away the full humanity of people living these lives, right? Um, and so even with the term unauthorized, when I talk about undocumented Asians, I don't use that term as well, because a lot of undocumented Asians actually migrate to the US um, and, and they are authorized, meaning they came here legally and sometimes um, visas may expire or there are other circumstances actually as to how people become undocumented, right? So that's why I don't use, specifically use that term. So through this talk, I will be mentioning undocumented, but again, I would like to say that none of these terms capture the full humanity and dignity of undocumented people because these folks actually have documentation, but again, it's not the documentation as the US has defined it appropriate for us. So um, this image right here is something I'd like to show because when we talk about immigration, a lot of people think that it's a linear process and it's not at all, next slide. When in reality, it's such a convoluted and messy process. It's not linear at all. As you can see, this is just an uh, infographic that has, that has condensed this complexity. It's far larger than this, right? Um, and I think that's something I'd also like to um, acknowledge is that 
the immigration system that we know um, as of today has not always existed in the U.S. actually. Um, in the early 1900s, so in the 1920s, uh, the immigration system was actually pretty open when it came to European immigrants um, migrating to the U.S. and that and it restricted um, a lot of other communities, actually. So for European immigrants, yes, there's been restrictions in the past, but in the 1920s, um, they were open to freely move in the in the U.S. Um, even though, again, it became more regulated as the years, um, you know, passed by. And another point that I'd like to make is um, to remember this history that the United States is a settler colonial state, and what um, that means is that settlers from Europe came to the United States, um, annihilated Native people on this land, forced assimilation, and claimed it as theirs to further expand um, on it and also create what we know as the United States of America. So when we think about whose land is this, it is the Native people. And that is something that we really need to remember in our discussion of immigration as well. So as you can see, a lot of folks, so when they talk about um, immigration, they'll, they'll ask somebody or something that they'll say to other people is, what part of illegal don't you understand, right? When we should be asking ourselves what part of legal and legal status more specifically do you actually understand? Legal status, like I've said before, is more than just about being a citizen and being a, uh, somebody who's not a citizen, right? There is this topology that researchers and scholars have taken the time to create and develop uh, um, when it comes to categorizing what legal status is. And there's different types. So all of these um, encompass what legal status is. And what we usually think about is somebody who's a naturalized citizen and then somebody who's undocumented, but we don't necessarily talk about the other statuses, right? Like somebody who is a permanent, um, who has a permanent status or, and these folks are the ones with legal permanent residence, your refugees, your asylees, people who get P visas or um, are eligible for VAWA as well. Those with temporary status are those um, that come here as either uh, foreign, foreign students or those employees with the intent to work, right? Discretionary statuses, um, PPS, those with DACA. So some form of protection, um, but not, not a lot. And of course, with undocumented status, there's really not any protection at all. And that's something I, I would also like to note as you're looking at the slide is that those who have permanent status, temporary status, and discretionary status, these are not fixed, that they're not permanent, and um, they're actually liminal. And in research, when we think about and use the term liminal, that means uncertain and ambiguous, meaning they can be deported at any time depending on the circumstances that the law has created or their personal circumstances. And also they can become undocumented. So this is what we mean when um, a lot of researchers say that legal status is more complicated than what we talk about it um, on, on the news or in conversations with other folks. Now, as you can see, and the next slides that we will go over, uh, we'll go over the demographic portrait of the immigrant population in the United States and more specifically undocumented immigrants. So in the US, um, it's estimated to be uh, about 45.7 million immigrants living here. And if we break this down, um, more than half uh, are actually here not as naturalized citizens, right? I'm um, thinking about the topology that I had mentioned earlier, and you saw that in the previous slide, a lot of these folks are either permanent residents, have temporary statuses, or undocumented are, are undocumented immigrants. And you can see about a quarter of them are undocumented. And we'll break this down by country of origin now when it comes to undocumented um, population. And these are statistics that sometimes we often don't see in the news because the narrative on the news is um, sometimes very skewed. And so it's really important to understand the demographic picture of where immigrants are coming from or migrants, right? Because, um, because what we'll see is then this conversation about race, and I'll get into that later, how immigration has been a racialized topic and how that has an effect and consequences on those who are undocumented or have a, another type of legal status that are, are also vulnerable. So as mentioned before, I'm, um, I said that race is really important and I did not break down those percentages in the previous slide into racial categories, right? It's, um, I broke them down by country of origin, which is what data usually presents. 
because race is a social construct, meaning that it has been constructed in society. The definitions of it has changed through time and space, and researchers have known this um, and have also written about it, right? And so um, when we talk about race, about uh, migrants or immigrants that are coming from different parts of the world, like Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, Central and South America, Europe, Mexico, and the Pacific, it's really important because when they set foot in the United States, then they have to learn what it means to be this type of race that the U.S. has basically imposed on them. So it's not just about learning this new racial identity, um, but it's also being able to ne negotiate what that means in terms of other intersecting identities that they have and then navigating what that looks like for the consequences that it may have in their life. So just talk about race and the meanings that we assign to race and to groups of people is um, a term called racialization. And it is it really focuses on the definition of race, the meanings we attach to it, and then the racial meanings that are used to produce and reproduce racism. So race and racialization cannot be separated from each other. They are actually intricately laced, like complex, right? Um, and they cannot be disconnected from racism. So it's really important to understand how different communities in the U.S. have been racialized because then that affects the topic of um, undocumented immigrants these days, depending on how they are perceived racially in the United States. Now, I would also like to note that in this conversation, all of these groups, while they may experience being undocumented differently because of race being a factor in that, there is also this shared sense of fear and uncertainty um, and being exploited in a system, right, that only cares about your body as labor and not necessarily treating them as humans. This is something that a lot of undocumented folks share this, this sentiment. And at the same time, I would also like to acknowledge that undocumented folks are incredibly resilient. The system that we have created for them in the United States isn't for them. It doesn't include them. Think about them. Think about their difficulties and challenges. And the, the students that I've worked with uh, um, and the undocumented folks that I have spoken with um, are actually some of the most creative people in this world. And it's because they've had no other option rather than to be creative and actually reimagine a world that they can live in and survive and also thrive, right? And so that's why it's really important to talk about race in all of this and it can't, it can't be ignored because um, these, these experiences of undocumented communities do vary, even though they have similarities, there's also a lot of differences. As you can see, I will be inserting quotes here and there from a lot of people that I'd also like to honor in this presentation through their words, right? One of them um, being Mel Orphelia, and his quote says, and this is a quote I live by, is no history, no self, no history, no self. Um, much more powerful when you see it as opposed to just saying it out loud. Um, and he is a Filipino historian and also a martial artist. And so I think to to ground us in history, it's really important to talk about undocumented Asian history. These are two books um, I'd recommend when trying to think about how do I learn about undocumented Asians more specifically, right? These brilliant historians have done the work to write these books. So when you get the chance, please do read them. Um, so May Ngai wrote an impossible subject that really documents in detail how laws and policies have created um, a, a res uh, restrictions for undocumented Asians to come to the U.S. Um, and, and it's written really well. And also in the making of Asian America, Erica Lee in chapter um, nine of her book, talks about undocumented Asian immigrants and this history of it as well. So I'd recommend these books and a lot of the information that I'll be discussing in these next slides um, is, is from these books. And so I'd like to give credit to where it's due. So a lot of folks, when we think about Asian American history, we learn about the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, right? And we also know that in learning about this from schools, uh, that it basically barred Chinese people from entering the U.S. The, what the information that is really significant about this act is it's the first law to actually exclude a group of people because of race. I'll repeat that again. It is the first law 
immigration law in the U.S. to exclude a specific group of people because of their race. That is really important because when we think and say that laws are neutral, we can clearly see historically, empirically proven by research that it hasn't been that case, right? And so when we think about, again, undocumented status, people aren't just undocumented. They don't exist as undocumented. Restrictive U.S. laws and policies have created them to be undocumented by restricting their access of entry to a land, right? Um, and this picture was actually published in Harper's Weekly in 1870, so before the act was even instituted, and it was really to ah, the social imaginary, so people living in the U.S. that uh, that the Chinese folks were a threat, right? And this is something that we still see today, this literal and metaphorical symbol of a wall. And now the, the narrative just has shifted to another group of people. So I think it's important to recognize this history because for communities of color in the US and groups that have been racialized, there are a lot of shared histories um, that parallel to one another. And we see it repeating yet at the same time, because often this is not necessarily told or taught in books in the classrooms. Uh, we don't recognize that this has happened before um, with, a, uh, with the same frame, just different pictures, right? So it's important to acknowledge this part of history. So again, like I mentioned before, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 excluded a group because of their race, right? So now, as you can see, a lot of U.S. restrictive laws and policies also create uh, an informal economy, where again, bodies that are wanting to um, go to the U.S. are then further exploited, and the informal economy profits from this. So, for example, even though there was an exclusion act that happened that basically barred entry for and towards Chinese folks back then, the Chinese weren't going to stop coming to the United States. So, again. As I've mentioned before, there are events in, there were events in China that was happening at the time where um, Chinese folks were fleeing from war or poverty. And um, Ronald Sakaki, a historian, uh, said that these are, and other immigration scholars, right? They say that these are push and pull factors that are residues of colonialism, imperialism, um, depending on the country that we're talking about where a lot of migrants and people will um, go to another country to basically try to get more opportunities and provide a better life for themselves and their families. So again, these policies also not only create an undocumented status for folks, excluding them, right? Uh, they also create an informal economy where bodies are exploited and profited uh, from. Another system in this that was basically a byproduct of the Chinese Exclusion Act and also the San Francisco earthquake that happened in the early 1900s is um, the, the term in the system paper sons. And this is important to mention because, again, Chinese folks didn't want to deceive uh, others and the, the government. Again, they were trying to come to the U.S. at this time to create a better life for themselves and their family. And because they were barred from entry and there were already folks that uh, came here and it ha has established, right, uh, a life for themselves. Um, paper sons that happened and, and what this is, is that it was a system where people basically presented fraudulent documents to their government saying that they were related to a Chinese American who was already a U.S. citizen. Um, what would happen is the father of the household would basically re report the birth of a son, and even though there was no such thing that happened. And this term was called a slot, so if a slot was available for sale, again, making money, right, off of this system, um, it was sale towards young, say young boys or young males in China that actually had no family relationship in the U.S. Um, and they would enter the country in that way because, again, because of the earthquake, there was really no way to trace back these documents before. So um, it's really important to recognize this history because this is also history that I didn't learn until later on, right? A part of the undocumented Asian narrative that often is not talked about in the books. And, and it's important to, again, mention this because 
again, U.S. restrictive laws and policies have created these systems uh, where folks are excluded, then an informal economy happens where they are uh, brought to the U.S. either through smuggling routes or even through these systems where fraudulent documents are presented. So yes, the people are um, taking participating in what we would deem as illegitimate activities. And at the same time, we need to start thinking about the larger system that has created these conditions to happen. So now that we've gone over history, it's really important to talk about the current um, immigration and migration from Asia. So I will be showing you statistics about that and then really talking about the racialization of undocumented Asians. Um, and this is really important because it's not included in, in what it's taught in the classroom. And when books exclude Asian American history, it implicitly communicates to students that Asians aren't a part of US history, therefore reinforcing these um, narratives that Asian Americans are forever foreigners. And, and I think censoring this conversation on undocumented Asians is also important because Asians and Asian American history is really built on sediment of colonialism, imperialism, intra-racial and ethnic conflicts as well. It's important to recognize that within our own community, um, transnational geographic displacement that happened from wars, right? And also the U.S. economy's demand for labor. For, for labor and using bot, their, their bodies as labor. And again, as I mentioned over and over, which is a point that I really do emphasize is that these US immigration policies have structurally included and also excluded Asian Americans in society, depending on what time that is. So in other words, all that I'm saying is Asian and Asian American history is complex and I know that this part of the presentation will be able to fully capture that, but I do hope that the information that I presented to you and will continue to present will serve as a point of departure um, for discussions, especially in the classroom for educators that can really humanize the experiences of these individuals. As you can see, um, undocumented migrants, especially from Asia, um, are arising, okay? They're rising at incredible rates and it's, it's important to um, recognize this uh, statistical point because then what happens is we will actually see um, the demography of our our country change as well because of that, right? If we break that down by country of origin, you can see that a lot of um, undocumented Asians are coming from India, China, the Philippines, South Korea, Vietnam, and also Pakistan. Um, also really important to note specifically in this aggregating this data by country, right, to see where folks are coming from. And now if we break down this information as to where the 1.7 um, undocumented Asians uh, live, a lot of them live in California. Um, New York, Texas, New Jersey, Illinois, Virginia, Florida, and Washington. And obviously there's, there's more that exist in various states and these are the top states where they are currently residing in. So it, wherever you are watching this presentation, really important to understand these numbers so that you can understand who is in your community, who is a part of our community, right? And thinking about the ways that you then can learn more about the undocumented population, population and migrants in general. Now that you all have seen the numbers of a national portrait of undocumented Asians, more generally, more specifically, um, Asians themselves, you can see here that a lot of undocumented Asians are actually eligible for DACA. And on the left, you'll see the requirements for DACA, right? And what this doesn't show is DACA is expensive. People have to pay about $495 to also apply for DACA. So that's not what you're seeing on the slide, but I'd like to tell you that because it's not just applying for DACA, you have to meet requirements, okay? And you gotta pay for it. And there's so many other barriers in the process that really make it difficult for people to apply um, to, to, to get DACA. Um, and with the number eligible, next slide, the amount of uh, uh, recipients that, that apply and actually get it um, are really low. So for undocumented Asians, there is really a disproportionate participation rate, right? And so 
I presented to you a lot of information already, whether that was statistics or historically. And as you can see, undocumented Asians, they exist in, in the country. There's a lot of undocumented Asian folks, right? Yet at the same time, the number of those that are applying to DACA and then receive it, they're incredibly low. So that really begs us the question, what's going on here? And so a lot of my work really focuses on the intersection of race and legal status and more, more specifically about legal status is an undocumented status, right? And there have been studies that have basically looked into the experiences of undocumented students. Um, I do work in higher education. So what that means is we look into what, um, what, what access means, persistence, um, degree completion, means for students in college. And so a lot of this work and what I'll be talking about comes from a higher education perspective and lens. And at the same time, it really applies broadly to education overall. So in the, the research and the literature that I've read, there is a lot of work that has focused and focused on the experiences of undocumented college students, right? And at the same time, what continues to be missing is how we understand how race can be a factor in the experiences of undocumented students, how, how racial meaning is, is ascribed, assigned, and attached through this process that I've mentioned before is racialization that really shape um, how they navigate college, how they need navigate life in general, right? So I'd like to say again the definition of racialization that it's about defining race, attaching the meaning to race, um, and then thinking about how these racial meanings are used to produce and reproduce racism. So race and racialization cannot be separated from each other because it really contributes to the maintenance of racial inequality and reproduction of racial ra um, racism. And, and so when we talk about undocumented status, because people have a lot of identities that intersect with one another and because of how race has been socially and legally constructed in the United States, it's really important to make sure that we also examine the, the undocumented narrative with a racial lens in mind, especially as we talk about Asian and Asian Americans. So as you can see here, a lot of the headlines are actually from newspapers or articles uh, that was printed on the internet regarding the experiences of undocumented Asian folks, um, whether that was through their story or another person's lens, right? And there's themes that vary as these pop out in front of your screen. Um, there's themes of being left out of the conversation, themes of silence and stigma. And at the same time, there's also themes that you saw that were of resilience and youth finding the creative ways to find their voice and speak up, right? So all in all, this is very complicated. And as we think about what I just mentioned about race, racialization, we need to figure out the ways that racialization does affect all of this. This is something that has yet um, to be explored. So these two uh, scholars published uh, articles in legal journals. And um, Denny Chan published uh, this article in 2013, and um, Esther Unicho published it in 2017. And they uh, coined these terms called invisibility cloak and double bind, right? And I was, as I was mentioning before, it's really important to talk about racialization um, for undocumented Asians because the way Asian and Asian Americans have been racialized in the US has been through the lens of being labeled a quote unquote model minority. And although this term has come up in the 1960s, historians have also proven that there were ways that mo the model minority has been placed on um, Asian American communities, but was not necessarily the term used uh, back then to describe these communities, right? Of being obedient, following the rules, staying silent, um, being successful in comparison to other groups. And I know that the model minority is something that has been in this, discussed in a previous webinar before, so I won't get too much into it, um, but further expand on it as how to this, how this contributes to the racialization of undocumented Asians, right? Because um, this racialization of being a model minority has 
consistently have been used to justify um, Asian American students' dismissal, dismissal and also reject, rejection as minority students who are deserving of support in, in education. And so for undocumented Asians, this is a really unique dilemma because of their identity as being undocumented and Asian, right? So uh, with, their with their undocumented status, of course, they are not protected from the law by any means. And at the same time, if they phenotypically present as um, how others perceive somebody who is Asian in the US because of how, again, they're racialized, the meanings um, and definitions, again, that we attach to, to race, uh, and then placing it on a group of people or person. Um, being defined as a model minority, a lot of folks may see somebody who is an undocumented Asian not being undocumented at all because they may see that they may not have issues because they are perceived as a model minority and not needing those resources, right? So it's interesting because this really leads us to a conversation of then undocumented Asians are caught in this double bind. And what a double bind means is that whatever option you choose, there is no win-win situation because when somebody is somebody is undocumented Asian, there is basically uh, what what Cho says is that there's a shield that's um, being perceived as undocumented by not being perceived as undocumented, right? And this person can basically fly, fly under the radar. And at the same time, even though this person is not being racially profiled as undocumented, they may not receive immediate access to resources um, or other networks out there, right? And then other people would. So it's really important to understand this this complexity of what undocumented Asians may be experiencing as a double bind so that we can provide and create an environment for, for those folks to basically want to reach out um, and are comfortable to reach out to others to, to get resources, right? Um, it's understanding the experiences of people and where they're coming from and why they're choosing not to speak up. So this really leads us to this conversation of um, silence and that comes with a double bind because for a lot of folks there is this model minority basically label that has been placed the racialization of Asian Americans is what I like to say um, protects protects undocumented Asians in some aspect right not all aspects obviously it protects them from being racially profiled as undocumented where life goes on um, and they're not seen as a threat Yet at the same time, again, they may not receive the resources. So uh, a large part of this conversation is about speaking up or not speaking up, right? And it's important to understand that silence is more complicated than seeing it as a positive and a negative thing where speaking up is positive and not speaking up is negative. It's far more complicated than that because first of all, when we talk about undocumented Asians, it's about giving them the choice whether they want to choose to disclose or not, right? Um, and I and it's understandable that casting silence, again, um, by Negron Gonzalez, um, they say that it, it can be a dangerous choice because it leads to further structural exclusion and social isolation. And at the same time, Figueroa says that choosing not to disclose can also be an act of resistance and empowerment. If we truly think and center Asian American history in this, there have been times where Asian American folks and Asians in um, the, their country of origin have been threatened to speak up, right, by, by political government. And also, if we think about colonialism and imperialism, silence and the stigma to basically say anything out loud or talk about issues are also byproducts of what has happened to Asian communities. So it's important to note that when we talk about stigma, silence, obedience, listening to folks, that we don't attribute these terms to something that's cultural to the Asian American community, but rather byproducts of wars, right? Geographic displacement, conflicts that have happened in Asian countries, and again, colonialism and imperialism. Um, and so it's really important to not just basically impose the speaking up on undocumented communities, especially for undocumented Asian communities, because we may not know the circumstances and also their experience.
experiences that in which they choose not to disclose their status to others. So I'd like to honor um, Teresa Lee's story in this because um, we've been talking about history and racialization um, throughout this presentation. And she is um, the individual that has really inspired the, the, the DREAM Act. And, and her, her parents um, are Korean uh, immigrants and they fled from the Korean War, and she actually found out that she was undocumented at seven. So think about as an educator, right? Seven is such a young age for students to make sense and understand all the complexity that comes with an undocumented status. But in an interview, she says that even though she may not have understood what being undocumented meant for her and for her family, what she did understand was the risk of not being able to see her family again. And this is what many of our students and their families are experiencing. This, this sense of fear of being separated and taken away from, from one another, right? And it's important to also note that um, there's folks who may be undocumented individually, but also may belong to mixed status families. And it's important to bring up this up in conversation because then there's a lot of circumstances in terms of how people will, will be able to navigate school, work, and the rest of their life, especially when they have family members with mixed status. So mixed status means that somebody could be a citizen, right, a naturalized citizen, or even somebody who was born in this country getting birthright citizenship, uh, and somebody who is also undocumented in that family. Somebody could also have a um, temporary status in that family or a permanent status. So it's a, it, it's mixed status, meaning mixed status um, in a family. So again, important to honor um, Teresa's story in this because as we know, the DREAM Act did not pass. The, the Senate hearing was supposed to be scheduled in on September 12, 2001, but as we know, September 11th, uh, happened and the attack on the Twin Towers happened the day before. So everything was canceled after that. And, and I mentioned Teresa's story more specifically to really segue us into the next part of this webinar uh, in terms of the role of educators, because it was uh, an educator that talked to her, learned more about her and encouraged her to speak to a, a senator, right? The educator didn't force this on her, but more so really learn about Teresa's story, empathize with her, understand where she was coming from, and really empower Teresa to find her voice to speak up. Um, and so in this next section, we will be discussing um, practices and also resources um, that you can use as an educator. And I present to you uh, Dr. Lilla Watson, who is a, an Indigenous Australian artist, activist, and also academic, um, and I present to you this quote. And it's really important because a lot of folks just want to help others, right? But at the same time, it's interrogating what help means, what that constitutes, and also why do you want to help? What is it about you helping and supporting students? Where is that coming from? Asking these really important questions is important because even if we are we have the good intent of helping other people as educators. At the same time, that can, this type of allyship, right, can be misconstrued and at times it can do more harm and the impact can land differently, even though there was good intent in it. So it's not necessarily about helping others. And as you can see with this quote, it's about understanding that for us and how we function under a white supremacist society, that liberation, it's about liberation. Our liberation being bounded up with each other and not helping each other, but really working together to create a better society for future generations, right? Um, especially in this talk with undocumented folks. So for educators, it's important to note what federal policies are affecting undocumented students overall. And so these are just a, a couple, a, a few of them. And, and it's important to know policy and laws because these, these systems directly affect and have consequences for students. So for example, those working in K through 12, especially having uh, immigrant students in general, and we may not know who's undocumented or not in, in your group of students, right? It's important to note that um, all students have access to a K through 12 education and um, 
the Supreme Court established this in 1982 through Pyler versus Doe. However, this, this important um, decision is not extended to post-secondary education, meaning that this does not apply for students when they want to go to college. Um, DACA is something that we we know and have heard of, especially on the on the news um, in July, and it basically provides undocumented folks the opportunities to either work or go to school um, if they have met certain requirements. I used to on the previous slide and also pay that hefty fee, fee right? Um, the DREAM Act, uh, as mentioned in Teresa's story, this was not passed, but it would have provided a pathway for citizenship and FERPA. Um, also important to note because um, it basically doesn't allow for public school officials or the district to ask about a student's undocumented status, nor are the students and their families obligated to disclose their immigration status to people. Now, these are, this is updated information um, about undocumented students, those who are of age that are reaching high school uh, to graduate and those who actually graduate high school. I present this information because a lot of the numbers that are used have been the 65,000 undocumented students that graduate from high school. Um, and that has been referenced. The so 65,000 is a number that a lot of immigration scholars, education scholars that study um, uh, immigration and also work with undocumented students use the 65,000. Yet um, this report from the, the Migration Policy Institute basically came out last year and they have updated the numbers that there are actually a rising amount of undocumented students graduating from high school and it now being 98,000. As we break this down by uh, race, it's really important to also note that uh, within the Asian Pacific Islander category, this information is not disaggregated. And, and something that needs to be talked about is when we talk about Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, that when we mention those acronyms, AANHPI, API or APIA, to also make sure that we're also including Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders when we say those acronyms because oftentimes they are not included when using those terms it should not be a term that is just used to be inclusive but we have to be intentional in the 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 ways that we use these terms right so um the way they have gathered data from this is basically aggregating asian and pacific islanders which a lot of um, entities do when it comes to presenting data on asian americans and pacific islanders Although I present information in K through 12, it's also really important for educators to know the in-state tuition rates or also policies that affect undocumented students if they do choose to go to college, right? Because that can be a pathway for some um, that may have access or the support to do so. As students graduate from high school and have received an education because of Plyler versus Joe, regardless of immigration status, this is not the case if, they, if students want to go to college. So as you can see, there's 19 states with provisions for in-state tuition rates. So what that means is that undocumented students um, basically uh, will be able to pay what uh, in uh, residents of um, that state pay as well, as opposed to the out-of-state fee. And as you can see, there's 50, 50 states in the United States. There's only 19 states with these provisions. And in Virginia, it's actually for, uh, only for DACA. And on, at the bottom, uh, Arizona, Georgia, and India actually prohibit uh, in-state tuition rates for any undocumented student. And more specifically and more restrictively, in Alabama and South Carolina, undocumented students are actually prohibited from en enrolling in, in any public institution. Again, really important information to know um, and learn about as educators because if your student asks you and talks about their plans after graduating high school, whether that's working or going to college or joining the military or other pathways that um, you explore with them, if college is a pathway for them that they would like to explore and pursue, it's important to know what that means in terms of access, financial access and support for undocumented students. And more practically, I'd really like to leave us with 
these practices. Um, and I'll further elaborate on this when working with all undocumented students and undocumented Asian students specifically. I think first and foremost, um, as teachers and you know, as a former teacher and all the teachers out there watching this, I commend what you all do, um, especially during a time of COVID-19, right? When we're thinking about our students and how not only are they learning and getting information, but also their well-being. That, that's at the forefront of a lot of teachers right now is how are my students doing, right? Um, is really embodying this pedagogy of love. Bell Hooks does a great job theorizing a pedagogy of love. You can read it in her book, All About Love, and learn more about how she really teases this out, right? What that looks like, what it means, how would it practice in the classroom. So that could be a great resource. But it's not just about saying to your students that you care and you love them. How is that student receiving your love in the classroom? How then are you understanding their story, empathizing with them, right? And so that leads us to the next point of learning about in, um, trauma-informed approaches, especially for undocumented students. Uh, these students have gone through trauma in some way, shape, or form. And trauma can span um, from, from different types. And so it's important to know about that because it, it then shapes your practice because some people will see students having gone through challenges or not doing well in school and ask like, what's going on with you? As opposed to asking, what has happened to you? What has happened to the student's life that really has affected the way they're interact with um, other, other students, the way they're performing in school, the way they're behaving. It's understanding the conditions, right? The circumstances, the experiences that have really shaped the student as opposed to coming at it from a deficit lens and saying like, what is wrong with you? Like what's going on with you, right? Asking where they're coming, coming from and the trauma that they have experienced. Um, the third bullet point is um, showing undocumented students, especially now as teachers have taught virtually um, in, in their classrooms that, uh, that your classroom is safe. Now, there's no physical classroom now, but then I think for educators, it's important to think about then, how do you create this, this, safe, this safe environment? And not just saying like, this is a safe space, this is a safe environment. That term has often been co-opted and misused where you can say it, but students may not feel it. So it's about really demonstrating that in the language that you use with students, right? Maybe providing a visual of the butterfly somewhere, or even bringing up conversations about um, undocumented, what's happening with the undocumented community and engaging in that conversation to further empathize with, with the group and the community, what undocumented students may be facing without necessarily outing or disclosing students that you may know as undocumented, but making sure that others, other students know that this is a reality for the undocumented community, especially um, during a pandemic where there are undocumented folks that may not be doing well because they are not receiving the federal resources, right? That, that stimulus, the check that was given to other people, undocumented folks contribute to the US economy. They do pay taxes, yet at the same time, they do not get anything in return so how to have conversations like that in the classroom or bring it up as a current event right like being able to show undocumented students that your understanding you want to learn you want to engage to create that safe environment um the other part is something that we've talked about before is knowing federal and more specifically state and local policies that affect undocumented students and their families this is incredibly important because these are contextual depending on the different states that you are in, the different city, the, the climate of the, the city and the neighborhood, it's important to know the, the resources for these different immigrant communities. And so that leads us to the next point of being, being able to identify local resources in the community, because especially for undocumented Asian communities, there's, there's about 48 sub-ethnic, Asian American um, and Pacific Islander groups, right? If we break that up just to talk about Asian American communities, there's 24 sub ethnic groups. That ranges in a lot of languages, a lot of cultural nuances in being able to interact with Asian American communities. So a lot of local resources, it's important to identify those that are serving Asian and Asian American communities. And at the same time, if 
there is a family or a student that needs something translated in a different language, or there's just different cultural nuances when interacting with folks that people need to respect and honor when they're filling out applications with them, when they're talking with them on the phone, um, and to help them out, those are really important to know in your local community so that when your students ask you, you can easily point them to, to a resource. So having a list or a spreadsheet and coming and coming up with and creating it already would be very useful. Um, and lastly is creating documents with multiple languages, right? It's important. Um, and I know that schools already don't have enough resources. Um, so it's important to basically learn about your student, what they're experiencing, learn about the local resources in the community, and also leverage, right? Like work with um, different people in the community or your family or friends that may have access to others that may be able to translate um, different, different documents for you and your students and their families. It's important to know what is the undocumented Asian American population in, in your specific community so that you know, oh, these may be the languages that, that are spoken at home, right? Because again, everything is contextual. I'd like to leave us with a quote from Dr. Grace Lee Boggs um, as we talked about practices on that last slide and, and how we basically work together because all of our liberation is bounded together as, as previously seen um, from the words of Dr. Lilla Watson, right? That we really can't change society unless we take responsibility for it. That means our actions, the decisions that we make, uh, the words that we use when interacting with others, um, that we have to see ourselves as belonging to it. And also, we see ourselves as connected to each other, because then we'll really take this responsibility and ownership for changing it. And with that said, I'd like to leave you all with resources. Um, on the left, you'll see books book chapters and articles that are geared more towards learning about undocumented Asian students or undocumented Asians. And on social media, these are uh, handles on Instagram that are great resources for the overall undocumented population and undocumented students. And there's um, a couple that are more specifically geared to understanding more about undocumented Asians as well. And I know that this is a lot to talk about, such an important conversation, and at the same time, I know I'm not able to discuss and touch on so many other points here. Um, but again, that really leaves room to expand and further on this conversation for educators so that we can support students in an equitable way, not just supporting them in a way that provides the same opportunities, but equitable, meaning opportunities that are appropriate and really attend to their specific needs as students. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roseanne, for this really in, like deeply informative and powerful presentation. Um, I, I thank you so much uh, for your research, for all of the work that you're doing, and also talking to the audience and what uh, considerations and practices they can also do. Um, and, 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 and also take in um, and considering uh, classroom environments and students. I okay. um, uh, just want to remind visitors that um, if you'd like to see more talks, but also if you uh, additional resources related to this topic, please visit smithsonianapa.org backslash learn backslash not a stereotype. Thank you so much, Roseanne. You're welcome.